Hi, this is Dr. Katherine Harris. This is English 56B. Today is the lecture on Introduction to the Victorians, and we have quite a bit that we're going to cover. So I will try to give you as much as I possibly can. There are a few handouts that you should take a look at if you are following along today, but I'm going to take you on a screencast today instead of you looking at me. So what we're talking about today is the start of the Victorian period, which is arguably 1832 to 1902, and it spans the lifetime of Queen Victoria of England. She was also known as the Empress of India. She was also known as Britannia, as in the sun never sets on Britannia. What you have before you on your screen is that timeline that I gave you at the beginning of the semester, a long 19th century British timeline. We've gone through the Romantic period, as you can see, and we're picking up right here, right around 1830, the first steam-powered railway. And I mentioned that has some effects on industrialism uh, before. We also have the 1832 Reform Bill, where more people, people who didn't actually own land, were allowed to vote. You could rent land and vote. 1833 was the abolition of slavery in the British Empire. The Factory Act was passed. 1837 is the accession of Queen Victoria to 1901. And some of the other things that are more important, 1839, photography is established. Then we get 1840, Dickens' Old Curiosity Shop is serialized. We get Percy Shelley's A Defense of Poetry is finally published, and he's from the Romantic period. Remember, he's died in the 1820s. In 1842, Muddy's Circulating Library is founded. Copyright is extended to 42 years or 72, seven years after the death of the author. This is really important because it changes the act of Queen Anne. And William Wordsworth, if you'll recall, also helped author that 1842 Copyright Act. 1843, 1843, yes, that's Wordsworth, it does become the Poet Laureate. 1845 and 1844, we have some more legislation that protects women and children in terms of how long they can actually work. 1845, we also have Ingalls, the condition of the working class in England, and we're going to get to working class in a different lecture. 1845 to 1850 is very important in the British history. It's the famine, the potato famine in Ireland, where six million Irish either died or immigrated, usually to the U.S. 1846, the Commercial Telegraph Service begins, patented in 1837. This is quite significant. They can communicate with people across oceans. We see the Communist Manifesto comes out, but people don't really start reading it until a little bit later. 1847, the first operation using chloroform, and this is also around the same time that they've decided to experiment with chloroform on women who are giving birth, and the first woman they experimented on was Queen Victoria. Hmm. We also have the 10 Hours Act, limits the working day. Uh, the Irish uprisings, they wanted their own uh, House of Commons back. They wanted their own government. And then we start getting into the second half of the Victorian period. Every 10 years, the Victorian period changes, and it's very difficult to study. Um, around uh, 1856, we see Aurora Lee by Elizabeth Barrett Browning is authored. It's a an epic poem, one of the first and the best ones authored by a woman. 1855 is important. We have the, the Daily Telegraph is the first mass circulation daily newspaper. Uh, we also have the Indian Mutiny in 1857 and the Matrimonial Causes Act in 1857, which means that women could sue for divorce by this time. 1859, Darwin's Origin of Species, and I asked you to read that for today. Uh, we've also got the American Civil War through 1865, and then 1865 is the transatlantic cable is opened, and we get Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the first real children's book. If you scroll down, you see a little bit further, we have Darwin's Descent of Man, 1872 is The Secret Ballot, uh, Lewis Carroll, Hunting of the Snark, we have The Incandescent Lamp, What's Created by Edison in 1879, that's got major implications, 1886 and 1885 saw huge in movements in technology and industrialization. We get Kipling, Rudyard Kipling coming to us in 1888 and throughout actually the 1880s. And then we'll get to a little bit of Wilde and Bram Stoker's Dracula at the end of the se at the end of the century and it's called the Fin de Siacle, Death of Victoria in 1901 and then in 1902 Conrad's Heart of Darkness if you haven't read it before. <laughs> 
So that's an overview of some of the major things that start to happen in, uh, in the Victorian period. Let's take a look at some very specifics. Some important dates in the Victorian period. There's an increase of reading materials and the use of incandescent lights. We have the first steam-powered railway, the 1832 First Reform Bill and Corn Laws. Reform Bill allowed uh, the vote to tenants with a rent of 50 pounds or more yearly. You don't have to own the land. The Corn Laws tried to protect important the import of agriculture, but instead it raised food prices. 1833, I'm going to come back to this over and over again, the abolition, abolition of the slave trade in the British Empire, and then Victoria. Here we have the major Victorian authors and poets, and I bet you've read some of them. Charles Dickens is first on our list. If you've never read Jude the Obscure, you should pick it up. It doesn't end well. Just to let you know, most Victorian novels don't end well. Robert Browning's My Last Duchess is quite significant, which we will read. Of course, Darwin's Origins on the Origins of the Species. Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, which we will read. The Sherlock Holmes novels, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Florence Nightingale, you've most likely heard of. Wilkie Collins, you may not have, but The Moonstone was the first de detective fiction novel that was ever created. Uh, then on the other side, we get Christina Rossetti and Dante Gabriel Rossetti, two who we will try to read a little bit later in the semester. And then we also get Edward Lear, Beatrix Potter, uh, Rudyard Kipling, H. Ryder Haggard. He's the one who's also written the novel called She that I mentioned before, and of course Bram Stoker's Dracula, which we all know about, and E.M. Forrester's A Passage to India. So you should be continuing by this time on to the Visit the Special Collections in Your Time slot. If you haven't and you have a, a later slot, start doing the preparations for it. Read up a little bit on Dickens, look at the Wikipedia entry for Bleak House and Dickens himself, uh, and then go through some of the other videos that we have so that you can be prepared when you do look at it. Today I want to talk about industrialism and the introduction to the Victorians. It's, it's called in Industrialism, Progress or Decline, what I've Astrid Reed and the Norton, Darwin's On the Origin of Species, and also I added Dickens' A Visit to Newgate, which was a prison. I didn't, by the time that I wrote this up there, I don't have my Norton anthology with me, so if you take a look at it and find the page numbers, that would be great. You also see on the right side of your screen for Tuesday, read all of the text, watch the intro to Victorian's video and accompanying information, begin work on the blog post that will be due Wednesday at 6 p.m. And at some point in this video, I'll, I will let you know exactly what that blog post is, as well as the tag. So here's what we have in the introduction to the Victorians. The biggest thing that you need to know is a withering of the individual. There's an artistic and poetic and scientific sense to the individual now. It's more focused on the actual community. Remember, the individual was really the focus of the Romantic period, even with Shelley and Keats, though they were writing about expanding things out politically. Access to cheap reading materials means Dickens comes in. Also, the railway and the steam engine help create well, railway or novels that are severely truncated versions. They became their own genre. That's railway novels. You say that fast three times. Uh, there's an increase of reading materials and the use of incandescent lights, which are cheaper than candles and allowed people to read later into the evening. In terms of communication, we have the telegraph, the telephone, the radio, and photography during the Victorian period. We are at the height of the Industrial Revolution. People flocked to cities to get work in factories, including women and children, and they were exploited as cheap labor. The reforms to British law and religion and unionization by laborers created a safer working environment. We put women and children out of work from the factories. Now, in, in the beginning with the factories and the urbanization of labor, women and children would work up to 18-hour days, children as young as five years old. Women's rights, they earned a proper education in colleges. The first women's college were not created until the 1850s or 1860s in England. Women earned rights in marriage as well. There were advances in medical technology enough to de decrease the infant mortality rate and then the use of chloroform for childbirth. At some point, if you guys are interested, we should take a look at Gray's Anatomy, which are drawings that were created in the 19th century. Not talking about the TV show. <laughs> 
In science, at first we have phrenology and then discounting it. Then we move to geology and chemistry. We also have massive colonial expansion. Now that's a topic for another lecture when we get to Jane Eyre, though. For today's reading, what I asked you to read was really a lot of nonfiction, Darwin and Dickens, before you get into the Dickens serials and also before you get into uh, Jane Eyre, one of our novels. I would ask you to consider as you're reading, how do these writings differ from the Romantic period writings in terms of nonfiction? And what happens to that poet genius? in these writings as we move along in the Victorian period. Is there an ethereal angel? Is it more of a concern for community and social justice? And my response to that is yes, but I'd also like to see what you have to say. So the Victorians do inherit some romanticism. The artist, the poet especially, needs to cope with romanticism's nature and feeling. Now, the problem is that the Victorians discovered that using the self as the subject in art produces despair or drives people back to religion. The Romantics discovered this, but it was a little bit too late. The Victorians are no longer persuaded um, to the light of Romanticism. The Victorians are forced to believing in a set way of ideas or thinking, and we're going to see this a lot in what it is that we're reading, especially with Jane Eyre. Now, the Victorians are known for being prim and austere, but I want to warn you that in the 19th century was the birth of pornography in England. So let's not think about them as being too prim and austere. The Victorian poet is like a self-critical romantic, but the Victorian poet knows that he or she can't live only in the imagination, the intuition, or in solitude, particularly in nature. The Victorian poet is very self-conscious, because they didn't do justice to rising social, political, economic complexity of the time. Shelley, Percy Shelley began this work somewhat in the 1820s, but wasn't able to complete it because he died very young. For the Victorian poet, there's a shift from subjectivity to community, single person to the masses. It wasn't an easy transition, and there is tension apparent in the works. Now, Victorian poetry takes on a polished dramatic monologue, which, which is a, a revamped style of poetry. The Victorians don't necessarily write good plays because they were too romantic. They have a, the Victorian poetry has a troubled sense of consciousness. The persona dramatizes itself due to sensitiv sensitivity of subjectivity and admissions to inner turmoil. Victorian poetry attempts not to live in art, but instead to include the collective. They stumble into a dramatic statement with Victorian poetry and this dramatized psychological state. The imagination for the Victorian poets is historical more than anything else. There's a great importance placed on history in their literature. Artists and painters like William Morris and all the pre-Raphaelites who are later Victorians, which we'll get to actually when I return, they believed poetry should be read quickly and out loud, as if it were performed. Okay, so let's go over to Darwin's Origin of Species, and it was published in 1858, so we're hopping around in the Victorian period a little bit, but this is a result of a lot of work that Darwin did. This was published in 1858. It was the result of travel on the Beagle in 1838. It was a representation of the natural world to make it less mysterious. The writing in Darwin's Origin of Species is really questions the philosophy uh, of religion and social stratifications of the current community. Darwin comes up with a theory of natural selection that is really equated with the struggle for existence. And this is what he says urban centers really become. So you don't necessarily, it's, it's not survival of the fittest. That never came from Darwin. That was a derivation or a bastardization of the origin of species. What he really focuses on is this idea of natural selection, this struggle for existence. It brought humans closer to animals in this particular work, and people didn't really appreciate that because they were struggling with their religion still in the Victorian period. It related society to struggle of survival found in nature, and it became this idea of social Darwinism with initial caps. <laughs>
We're going to see social Darwinism happen in the stuff that you're reading in Dickens' serials. It's that selection. It's the one who pushes forward. And it's the one who pushes forward and is successful is not necessarily in a lot of the novels in the Victorian period. That's not necessarily the nicest guy. We don't necessarily see this from Frankenstein. We're going to see this in Jane Eyre, though. Let's move on to Charles Dickens' nonfiction piece, A Visit to Newgate. Now, this was published in 1836, it's just before Queen Victoria was going to ascend to the throne. Remember, the Industrial Revolution is in full bore at this particular time. Dickens writes under the guise of this thing called Sketches by Boz. That's Dickens. He becomes the champion of the poor, and he exhibits this in his novel Great Expectations. His rhetoric is it uses the first person plural as if it's a community behind him. Dickens is not necessarily identified himself as the source of all of this information. The sketch def is defined not as a description. Instead, it has political leanings and social class. And he writes, we were disappointed he had not even top boots on. Now, Dickens visited to America and wrote about a bootmaker. And Dickens also worked in a blacking warehouse. That's a factory that made material for cleaning boots and shoes. So when he talks about in this particular line, we were disappointed, he had not even top boots on, he's making reference to this sense of factory work and industrialization. Who's going to be the one to shine those boots, to make up the materials, to actually do the, the work itself. There is a difference between the working class, poor, and then the people who are put into Newgate Prison just for being poor, and the people who wear those kinds of boots. Okay. In a visit to Newgate, he, rate, he relates it to Bedlam, and I talked about it in class in, uh, uh, in about the Romantic period. Bedlam was a hospital that was the largest structure in England until the late 18th century and there was it was a psychiatric hospital that really wasn't it was more of a place to dump people who had gone a bit insane but they were let to run around you've ever heard that the phrase it's a uh, bedlam in here that means that it's unruly and they're uh, it's unconscionable the way that people were treated they did sell tickets to into bedlam to, so people could watch the crazies running around and they did make enough money to uh, fund their staff. They eventually stopped doing that because they learned that that was probably not good to do and they were creating a whole class of criminally insane by doing those kinds of things. In this sketch by Boz, there are a bunch of social is issues that are addressed, but the one, there are a couple that I want to highlight, uh, mainly the one, this one. There's a disintegration of the family that's addressed. Uh, the whole family has to live in prison if the parent is imprisoned. And he discusses the children, and then there's no education because education isn't compulsory at this particular time, meaning that nobody was required to go and there was no truancy for children. This means that you, even though you import the family, the mother and the father and the children and keep them all together, which would be commended during the Romantic period, what Dickens here is doing is pointing out that it's an incarceration of the entire family. It's a suppression of the entire family and putting them into poverty, and then there's no way for them to climb up the scale. So this is very much in line with what Mary Wollstonecraft had wanted to say, but what Dickens is doing is turning the camera or the eye towards the lower and the working classes, rather than just talking about this vague notion of who are these people trying to crawl up the class structure. At the conclusion of Dickens' A Visit to Newgate, it's a precursor to the tone of his novels, and you can read it throughout. It's not meant to be satirical, ironic, or funny at all. Uh, the last part of the sketch is a scene almost exactly from Great Expectations. Now I'd like to take you over to uh, a database of mid-Victorian images. One of the things that one of the things that the Victorians did very well was develop a, a way to construct engravings. And with these engravings, they were able to demonstrate daily life. And daily life was not all that fun for them.
So here's what I would, and it makes it, it makes it recorded and it's timeless. So what I would like you to do is uh, search through the database of mid-Victorian images, and I'm about to give you your blog post in the tag. One of the things that this particular database does is catalog all of the titles, the engravers, the authors, the publication date, and the source, and it demonstrates the wealth of images in which the Victorians really heralded their own society. So for this particular one, for instance, I've sent you directly to the keyword search. If you search reading and leave all the other settings the way they are, order by illustrator or author, whatever, you click search and we have 68 results. So then we get images of people reading and they're very Interesting images here. For instance, the first one is a solitary person. It's George Wither in prison in a book called In Sacred Poetry. And it's the engraver, engraver is one of the Daziel brothers, and it was published in 1862. It's interesting that this man is alone. So if you click on the engraving itself, you get a larger version of it. And you can take a look at things like the header, the notes down here that tells you a little bit about it. And if you click on any of these people or any of these tags, you get to see, it does a search for those and you can see more of them. And let's go back. It's interesting that we have a group of men, paterfamilias, reading the, the Times, which is a newspaper, all together. And they're all spreading out and sharing it. And then the image that we get that first comes up of, of, is of women. And it's interesting that there is one who is back here. There's an angel, obviously, in the front, but one is distracted. They kept the noiseless tenor of their way. And it's from Thomas Gray's Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, churchyard published in 1862. And it's a vignette that appears after the 17th stanza. And you, and you can take a look through all of these images of reading. Now, I take this one as being very interesting. It's very patriarchal. You see the way the man is hanging over her shoulder, pointing to something as if instructing her, and she's sitting down to play. You can interpret that as a way to keep the hierarchy between the genders. Mm, this is a little bit of Mary Wollstonecraft. We should fight. Mary Wollstonecraft would fight back for this one. Here's your blog post that's due on Wednesday by 6 p.m. How does industrialism, let me start again, how does evidence of industrialism appear in three engravings that you find from the database of mid-Victorian illustrations? I want you to use three keyword searches and choose one image from each search. Your first search should be reading. Your second search should be work. Your third search should be poor. So you would just go back, type in work, hit search, and look how many you get to go through. Go back, and we would search poor. Look how many you've got to go through as well. Again, how does evidence of industrialism appear in these engravings that you've chosen. Make sure to provide a link back to your directly to your engraving. Uh, if you can figure it out, cut and paste the engraving directly into your blog post so I can see it. For each explanation, for each engraving, use 150 words. Include the source of the engraving and the year published in those 150 words. The tag is Victorian. So that concludes our introduction to the Victorians. It's really about the Industrial Revolution and technology and change every single decade throughout the entire 70 years that Victoria reigns.